It is a, a great privilege, pleasure, absolute joy to be here in Kansas City with you all. Last night was magical. And I liken these times with uh, those of like mind and like heart as kind of soul food. When we get to be with members of our tribe, uh, people who are grounded in the same values and beliefs that we hold dear. It really rejuvenates us. So it's, um, it's always important to start with disclosures and confessions. Um, <laughs> that, you know, we were supposed to start off with our conflict of interest, and I have none for this talk other than <laughs> I will provide you with a little bit of my own disclaimer in this talk. Um, I'm going to use the example of physician-patient a great deal in my discussion, and I use the talk about physicians a great deal in this talk. But that's not because I think that we're the be-all, end-all by any means or that there's some sort of hierarchy. It's just that I really have come to appreciate that after nearly, well, actually over now, 30 years of being a doctor, when did that happen, um, life does have a certain filter and a lens in the way that you look at things. And appreciating that we have a, a bias is important to understand those of the perspective of others. If we assume we don't, I think sometimes we miss the bigger point. But the real point in that is that we all are part of this, whether we are a health professional, a person of uh, the clergy who may or may not be in or involved professionally with healthcare, we're all involved in this because this is really about humanity. And if we're going to change healthcare in this country, and we must, it's going to take every one of us to be engaged. And I love Margaret Mead, you know, never doubt that a small group of committed people can change the world because indeed it is the only thing that ever has. So we have to lean in and make some of these changes. Some exciting things have happened in our work. And in particular, I celebrate daily this incredible field of palliative care and that it is now recognized in so many ways. And as one of my colleagues says, because we are so much a part of the discussion in healthcare reform, we're sitting at the cool kids' table now. Um, pa what palliative care also brings to the fore in medical care, and I'll touch on many aspects, is really an attention to what we call population health. Thinking not just in terms of the, inter the interview or the encounter with the patient, but very much about the bigger picture. And in this little diagram that was drawn by a colleague of mine, see if I can get it to work. Obviously, my work and the work of many in this room is focused on that little sliver, <clears throat> those who, who are seriously ill, advanced illness, and paying attention to their needs. However, <laughs> they are loved and cared for by the other people in the circle, in the community, sometimes who are equally as fragile as they. And what we become very aware of in the work that we do is the care and that experience of the seriously ill and how they die, just like our panel, affects those who live afterwards. In essence, hospice is the ultimate preventative medicine. Caring for people well at the end of life will change how we live. And it shouldn't be just about at the end of life. It should be through the journey of serious illness. It needs to move far upstream. We also, I think, have an opportunity which I'll probably say again, to look at palliative care and this whole idea of caring for people and their families as a public health issue. So often we talk about, I was lucky, and I met so-and-so, I was lucky because the hospital had a palliative care service. I don't want it to be about luck. <laughs> I want it to be the expected way that people receive care, that it is a quality expectation of health care in this country. It's not that we're lucky. It's that what we have to have that kind of care. So in this definition of palliative care, in the um, Code of Federal Regulations, actually appearing within the hospice section, it really emphasizes what palliative care is, that it is about caring for people and their families through a continuum of illness. Interestingly, though, this appears in the Code of Federal Regulations in the hospice section, 418.2, whatever. Um, <laughs> It, is, it says nothing about prognosis in this definition, if you notice. Just talks about patient and family-centered care that s seeks to promote quality of life and to relieve suffering. 
And by doing that, supporting people throughout the continuum of an illness, paying attention to the physical, the psychological, the spiritual, the emotional, the, the social, and in our day and age, the financial suffering that one can experience in illness, allows people to live until they die and those who love and care for them to live afterwards. We've made tremendous advances, I think, particularly in the last three years, that the conversation is more out there. You can see it in popular press, talking about advanced care planning, uh, many f features on television, and finally, we were able to, in, <laughs> with clandestine efforts, to get this CPT coding move forward, and knowing that now this could really be a part of what physicians are expected to provide and that they would be reimbursed for the time spent. Interestingly, about 80% of physicians say they don't know how to do this when surveyed. So we've got a lot of work to do. My work at Northwestern is primarily in teaching goals of care conversations to area hospitals, actually hospitals throughout Illinois. And what we've seen as in doing this and, and really spun supporting and growing primary and champion level palliative care is that the cultures of institutions begin to change. As teams learn how to navigate these conversations, regardless of their professional role, but as a team, we see the culture of the hospital change. And what we've come to appreciate is that goals of care conversations are a series of conversations best done over a long period of time by multiple different professionals and family members. And there are two aspects to this. There's the goals of care and then what we call care preferences. So goals of care, the overarching, what, it, what matters most to me? What's most important to me? How do I define quality of life and life's meaning? And then the preferences that support that, those preferences may change over time as my condition changes, but what I value likely will not. And those conversations are so important. So what I've come to appreciate through the teaching of many, and it's, it's interesting who our teachers are, and actually I will be sharing with you pictures and inspiration from some of my teachers in this talk, that Diane Meyer said this to me. So I had the privilege of, <laughs> of working on the, the initial national consensus project for quality palliative care that started in 2001 and was published on the web in 2004. So for three and a half years, we, every Friday, had a phone call. Three and a half years. That's like the gestation of an elephant. And it was amazing to me because this was the group coming together was myself representing the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine. We have Hospice and Palliative Nursing Association, Judy Lenz. We had the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization with Don Schumacher. We had Diane Meyer from the Center of Advancement of Palliative Care, who was our spark plug. And we also had a representative from Last Acts, which was another RWJ sponsored program for consumer advocacy. And we would meet to develop this document. And what happened in that time of creating that document was really what that was all about. The process was the product. It was, yes, it was wonderful that we published these guidelines, but what happened was the coming together of these groups, finding they had the same values, their vision might be a little different, but they could ground together and create one voice, a symphony in truth. And that coalition exists today. 15 years later. That lesson of it is about the process as much as it is what we produce has stayed with me and has been reinforced over and over again. And in truth, what I've come to appreciate is all this effort about creating advanced care planning and the documents and let's get this in your chart, et cetera. That's great, we want those things, but that's not the be all end all. It's about the conversations. And there actually are things happening in those conversations that are absolutely essential to healing, essential to really coming to terms with what's happening in our lives and how our preferences then evolve. So understanding that it is the listening, the generous listening, 
and being, becoming part of the story that is unfolding is essentially important to physicians as well as every healthcare professional. I do think that we are experiencing, quite frankly, a crisis of meaning within medicine for physicians right now. The burnout rate is about 54% on the re recent survey. And I think a large part of that is, is people grapple with what is my role, the reasons I went into medical school, and now what I find myself as a provider, <laughs> what is my role, and what, why am I here, and how is this meaningful? There is suffering on both sides of the sheet. So this article that I want to share with you is one article, but profound for me, really a, a writing that has become a touchstone and a frame of reference. This is by Dr. Thomas Agnew, who is a uh, PhD in education, University of Washington, great things happen out there, um, who decided to explore through qualitative research the idea of suffering. And he had some, some hypotheses. Whoops, what happened there? That's not supposed to be there. It's very sensitive, the button. Oh, my gosh. Okay, yeah. Ooh, ooh, sorry. It was an epileptic seizure there on my thing. So Agnew had some um, hypotheses. Medicine is traditionally considered a healing profession. That's used. But we got off the track, quite frankly, in the 1600s with René Descartes and his buddies as they started to discover physiology. And there was a schism that occurred in Cartesian dualism where medicine went off to be about the physical and about science and separated overtly from the world of the spirit. And so for the past 400 years, our platform has been about science and the physical and not about holism. Increasingly in that time has been, of course, technological advances, and particularly was the moment of antibiotic therapy in post-World War II. When we could change the outcome of an illness through an intervention, we became galvanized that that was the most important thing that we could do. And so physicians moved from being healers to curers, about curing disease, eradicating illness. We became warriors. The yin and yang absolutely got out of balance. Interestingly, other disciplines have done a better job of maintaining the language and the discussion around healing and wholeness, particularly in the nursing literature. They have increased, if anything, the discussion around being nurses in the role of healers, while at the same time, healing has essentially disappeared from the medical literature. There aren't any articles about healing. So medicine, interestingly, too, has no accepted definition of holistic healing, though it's assumed to be the core element of medical care. So Agnew's study was based on the following assumptions. Healing is a core function of medicine. Information concerning healing would benefit us and particularly medical pr practitioners. The personal and subjective nature of healing would best be explored through qualitative research versus what I call the cult of the randomized double-blinded crossover trial. <laughs> Doesn't lend itself to this. Useful information regarding healing and medicine would best be gathered from persons familiar with and experienced in allopathic medicine and information of the highest yield might be gained from physicians in particular who devoted their career to this area. So Agnew's article is a qualitative research study interviewing doctors Eric Cassell, Carl Hammerschlag, Thomas Inoue, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, Cicely Saunders, Bernie Siegel, and Gail Stevens. And then taking these conversations with these amazing people and um, analyzing them with what's called grounded theory analysis. So in this process, three themes emerged in these interviews, three consistent themes, and they had to do with wholeness, narrative, and spirituality. So wholeness 
was discussed or defined in these discussions as physical, emotional, intellectual, social, and spiritual aspects of the human experience. Sounds reflective of palliative care. The sub-themes associated with wholeness were transformation, loss and isolation, and suffering. Ill people experience transformation in their sense of wholeness, characterized by loss and isolation. Not being the persons they once were, or they've known themselves to be, they suffer. Wholeness is independent of physical health or cure. One can be cured and yet not be whole. One can be whole and yet be seriously ill. Healing is independent of illness, impairment, cure, disease, and even death itself. Healing is a phenomena of the human being. The other theory, narrative, or emerging theme. So the narrative, healing is in essence a reinterpretation of life and occurs within the life narrative of the person who is ill. Healing is experienced in connection with others. And illness can facilitate that connection and sometimes can also greatly interfere with that connection. And certainly medicalization can grossly interfere with that critical connection that facilitates healing. Inherently important in this narrative is continuity and relationship. Through continuity, the patient and their physician can come to know each other beyond simply roles, but as people. This allows healing because the physician begins to become a part of that person's life narrative as they experience their illness. The sharing, this, this facilitating of the unpacking of what it is that matters most and how what is happening to me now in my illness, how does that affect what matters most and how I live, how I see myself, is so critical in these conversations with a healing professional. It allows us to lay down our burdens and begin to develop basically a new life narrative, a new story out of our brokenness. Narratives of healing are created in close physician-patient relationships that are personal in nature and supported by continuity of care. And we can just pause there and think about how we have so damaged the system of healthcare in this country by breaking the vital relationships and continuity that are the very essence of what we need most. Something we need to fix. So healing again, independent of illness, impairment, cure of disease or death, experienced in connection with others. And it is a personal experience of the transcendence of suffering. And in my 29 years of 27 years of working in palliative care, see, witnessing that amazing transcendence of illness where people become whole despite advanced serious disease, excuse me, and despite being so close to their last breath is truly a profound experience, a holy experience. The third theme that emerged is spirituality that ineffable quality, the harmony of body, mind, and spirit. And the sub-themes of spirituality involved meaning, reconciliation, and transcendence. People experiencing healing were described as seeing or discovering meaning in their afflictions. I love this word, their pathographies. The story of their illness, but very much their story. Again, we go to this idea of telling stories. The illness awakens in them what is most important in their life. I so remember a young man, 
critical in my career, John, diagnosed with esophageal cancer at the age of 36, who transcended his illness and looked at me at one point and said, Martha, I have never lived like this before. I, where every conversation, every moment is, I am so alive. That was transcendence, and I have obviously never forgotten that. Healing is the personal experience of transcending suffering. Healing means to make sound or whole, and the word actually comes from hall, which means a state of being whole. It's also the root of the word holy, which means to be spiritually pure. Centuries-old associations between healing, wholeness, spirituality, challenges medical thinking. Whoa, we're like 400 years from there, right? How do we reconcile this? Medicine has no model of what it means to be whole. As persons, instead we value the objective rather than subjective. We value efficiencies <laughs> and we give negligible consideration to spirituality. Nowhere else but in our ICUs are we, we are so good at this. We disintegrate people into their body systems. And then we assign a different doctor to every one of them. So as was said, the, the physicians make their rounds. It's like a play from Moliere. The daughter says, how is my mother? And the kidney doctor says, she's peeing. And the pulmonary doctor says, she's breathing. And the heart doctor says, her heart beats. But no one has answered the question. Because it's not about the body systems. It's about the wholeness of who her mother is. And the whole idea, believe it or not, of palliative care is to push this reintegration, to reintegrate people into wholeness, to see people as people in the context of their family and their community, and to be present with them. What does it mean to suffer? Bodies don't suffer. People suffer as they come struggle with what is happening. They experience anguish, sense of isolation, an absence of meaning, preoccupation with the future or the past, but not even really able to be present, sense of victimization, a high need for control, wanting so to be in control, juxtaposed against peace, are you at peace is a word used in spiritual uh, assessments. A sense of connectedness to something larger and more enduring than self. Meaning discovered. Presence to the moment. A sympathetic connection to suffering. Seeing it, but not having to be consumed by it. A capacity to open to the present potential that is greater than the need to control. Is it going to go? <laughs> there we go. Ill people undergo transformations in which they are unable to be the people, the persons that they once were. This threat to wholeness generates suffering and involves physical, social, psychological, and spiritual dimensions of personhood. Suffering is an inherently unpleasant experience, reflecting perceptions of helplessness. It may involve pain, but it is much greater than pain. It alienates the sufferer from themselves and from society. Spir suffering engenders a crisis of meaning, a spiritual consideration of life's ultimate importance, and it is reflected as an intensely personal narrative, a narrative that has to find a voice. It is in the telling of that story, the unpacking of the experience, facilitated by professionals who will lean in to hear and gently ask the questions that evoke more of the narrative, that allows us to come to terms with what's happening. Truncating that process facilitates more and more suffering, more alienation. Viktor Frankl uh, is a must read for all our fellows, Man's Search for Meaning. 
because suffering can be resolved, but we have to know how to facilitate that resolution. We can remove some of the threats to wholeness. We can relieve distress. We can work to reinstate the sense of integrity. But medicine's fairly limited in that, particularly the medical model. It's absolutely incapable. It's inherent to being human, and there is so much more that medicine can't touch but can help. I love what Frankel says, that suffering can be trans transcended by finding meaning. When suffering finds meaning and when that, purpose when that person finds a sense of purpose in their suffering, it no longer is the same suffering. Shared suffering creates interpersonal meaning and melds the stories of the patient and the physician. This is Kate one of my first patients in palliative care, 36, 38 years old, same age as me, when she was diagnosed, or when she recurred for the third time with ovarian cancer, four children. She came to see me uh, for a consultation, and I thought I was in the wrong room because she came in her tennis outfit. I said, oh, I'm sorry. She goes, no, 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 you're here to see me. Kate had a desire to, as she said, live large for the time that I have, and my job in her life was to help make that possible. The, the narrative over the, the next three years together taught us both tremendous things. It is in that shared story. Creating interpersonal meaning and melding life stories produces connectional relation, a mutual experience of joining that results in the sensation of wholeness for Kate and also for me. As the physician becomes part of that patient's life narrative and experiences with them, patients don't suffer alone. That's the definition of compassion, to suffer alongside, to be present. The role of the physician healer is to establish connectual relationships with his or her patients and to guide them in reworking their life narratives to create meaning in and transcend their suffering not let their illness define them, live in spite and because of, to create a new life story. The patient must find the meaning. The physician can't define their meaning, can't ascribe or prescribe meaning. But the physician, the nurse, the social worker, all those who are part of the team can absolutely provide the catalyst to the process. Sensitively attending to and engaging in dialogue regarding what's happening and what it means and how we live in the midst of it. Sadly, our whole training as physicians is not about this. It's not about hearing the story. It's about truncating the story. Physicians, they say on average, it's about a minute and a half before they interrupt. 11 seconds, so it's gotten worse. Oh my gosh. They limit storytelling to maintain diagnostic clarity, <laughs> support efficiency, avoid confusion, and certainly to avoid unpleasant feelings, their own unpleasant feelings. That place of ambiguity. Where is this going to go? Can I just sit and listen? Learning how to be present in the narrative and understanding one's role in the narrative is where they are not taught. So not knowing how to engage in suffering risks actually iatrogenically causing it. This is my beloved father camp. <laughs> the secret of care of the patient is caring for the patient. That was published in JAMA in 1927. It's true. It's about a genuine affection for, a celebration of, an eagerness to see and be engaged with. This gentleman, who I had the privilege of caring for for many years, um, was a, the head of the um, Divine Word Fellowship in Illinois, which is an international order 
I go all over the country. Father Camp would bless me after every appointment, which was so incredible. I have a prayer. And then once he got back to um, his home, he would call me and thank me for the appointment. I have still my voicemails of Father Camp. Well, Martha, that's what he'd say. By forging connectual relationships, grounding treatment choices in the person rather than the disease, maximizing function, actively minimizing suffering, physicians strengthen patients with the goal of maintaining intactness and integrity. By helping patients transcend suffering, physicians surpass their curative roles to claim their heritage as healers. In the process, medicine recapitulates its service ethic as a work of heart and soul and maintains its tradition as a healing profession. As Eric Cassell so well said, 1982, a year prior to when many of our young physicians were even born. <laughs> the relief of suffering and the cure of disease are the twin obligations of a profession that is absolutely committed, dedicated to the care of the sick. Our failure to recognize the nature of suffering can result in interventions that, though technically adequate, indicated, part of the pathway, part of the guideline, not only fail to relieve suffering, but actually can become a part of suffering itself. There's a phenomenal young uh, intensivist that I have the joy of working with, Jeff Silberstein, who I love to go in the room with him because he would say to families, it's time for us to stop doing things to you and do things for you. Beautiful reframing. Tell me what is important. Too bad, I have to say, that these conversations are happening in the ICU and not in a doctor's office. So many of you know this amazing gentleman who really is the forefather of palliative medicine. Bao Mount, Dr. Balfour Mount, was a urologic surgeon at McGill University in Montreal, um, trained at Memorial Sloan Kettering to um, become an oncologic urologic surgeon, likes to say that he went across the pond to study with Saunders in England and came back to Montreal wanting to integrate this amazing way of caring for people, body, mind, and soul. Deeply grounded spiritual man, a Renaissance man. How could he make his care complete? Yet he was a surgeon involved in the diagnosis. Saunders' idea of hospice didn't work in French-speaking Quebec. Hospice is a halfway house for drug addicts. So that's not going to work. I can't use that word. And it wasn't about hospice. So he is the one who coined the term palliative care, palliative medicine and palliative care, the idea of wrapping and supporting and carrying folks through the illness such that they can weather the experience of being ill and come out on the other side with integrity. This is what he wanted to see very much take over all of medical care. And he mentored the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine into being. He writes most recently in this wonderful book on, called Whole Person Care, edited by Tom Hutchinson, that we have the opportunity to participate in the birth of a new paradigm one that entails a radical reframing of both diagnosis and therapeutics. How we see we are caring for, how we see those we are caring for, how we see others, and how we see ourselves. Because it must start, quite honestly, with a deep look at ourselves. You know, that old thing they say on the airplane, put your own oxygen mask on first before helping others. Learning self-compassion in medicine is a critical skill. Because when one has self-compassion, one can easily say, I don't know. I'll find out. I can't do it all. I need help from others. All those things that actually make us so much more effective as part of a team. And a team is absolutely what this requires. Caring for people is a team sport. And unfortunately, in our history, particularly in medicine, we have trained everybody in a silo. And then we put them all in the arena together and say, get along. <laughs> and they don't know how. 
It's not for want, not lack of wanting. It's ill-equipped to be part of a team. This is changing because for, research has shown us that team-delivered care is vastly superior to any other type of care delivery, working as a team. So right now what we experience in hospitals is what we call multidisciplinary. Multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary are not the same thing, and yet people use those words interchangeably. It makes me nuts. <laughs> multidisciplinary means that our role is what we maintain. It's like pieces of the pie. I go in, I write a note in the chart, and that's it. <laughs> I did my part. But I didn't talk to anybody else. I didn't collaborate, and goodness, I didn't communicate. I didn't put together the perspectives of other people, even housekeeping, to really know how to best care for this person. Interdisciplinary is the hand. Gorgeous analogy. We can be reminded of it all the time. Each has a distinct identity. However, together, they are so much more effective than anyone alone. In fact, a couple even share a tendon. Interprofessional, interrelated, interdependent. That's how we approach the care of the seriously ill. That's the place where we can really find the ability to heal. Again, the process being the product. In our history right now in medicine, unprecedented is what we call the silver tsunami. Multiple generations present at the same time. It is not unusual to have a family meeting where the 90-year-old woman mother is arguing with her 70-year-old daughter who's arguing with her 50-year-old daughter who's arguing with her 30-year-old daughter, and on it goes. There have been family meetings that I've attended, officiated, <laughs> with 30 members. 30 members. And teaching medical professionals how to enter that space and become a part and help is a skill. As important a skill as a surgical procedure, as anything we do in medicine, is learning how to conduct effectively a family meeting. Because that's where the narrative, the healing narrative, is often heard for the very first time. I remember coming to see a woman admitted multiple times, multiple myeloma, actually myelofibrosis, now transfusion dependent, in the hospital again with pneumonia. Her husband of 70 years greeted me at the door with his fists clenched, and he said, I hope you're not here to talk about dying, are you? I said, sir, I have no agenda. <laughs> actually, we're here, my team and me, to see if we can be of help to you and your wife. So we sit down. That's one of the first things you learn, right? Sit. Sometimes lower to elicit information, sometimes higher if everybody's going crazy. <laughs> Use your body. And we say, tell me what it is you understand about your illness. And we shut up. We allow the narrative to begin to unfold. I love that saying of this, the space between the notes is what makes a symphony beautiful. Yes. Learning how to be present in silence and allow that person to think Physicians, all of us, tend to jump in because we get uncomfortable. So in this discussion, this amazing lady, now in her 90s, talked about her illness, and she said, you know, I know I'm not going home this time. And her husband began to cry. And she put her hand on his, and she said, I've, I've really not wanted to talk about this because I know how much it upsets you. And he, through choke sobs, says, I see you getting sicker, and I don't know what to do. It's amazing how that conversation, that moment, you can almost feel <laughs> all the energy that has been spent in protecting one another and trying not to talk about it is now put towards things that are so much more productive, a, a kind of an easing an ability to take a deep breath. She had a checklist for us, let me tell you. All the things, she says, I am not dying until these things are done. 
I understand why she lived to 91. And in particular, one was her husband. How does he get to his medical appointments? How will he get his food? How will he get his groceries? You need to tell me. And once that's all done, then I will exit. And that's exactly what unfolded. This opportunity to be a part of the story. Absolutely incredibly important in how we need to train and model and be. Our young physicians make a pledge. They take the Hippocratic Oath, and I love this one. This one is from McGill. Understanding the reality of our own mortality, we endeavor instead to heal our fellow human beings and free them from constraints so they may flourish. What a gorgeous statement, flourish, that they might flourish. But do we really understand our own mortality, or are we afraid to even look it in the eye? Do we think that because we're in medicine, we get a buy? <laughs> it's not going to happen to me. How surreal it is when it does for ourselves and for our family members. What this very much points to me, though, again, re reconfirms is how much we need to heal our system of health care in this country. And it is these voices, you all being a part of that to advocate for continuity and relationship, to show how critically important it is to caring for those who are ill, for caring for anyone, for working as a team, to be trained as an interdisciplinary team, discipline specific alongside team-based care, and to value that, to place value on it so that it is continually supported. As was referenced in many of the talks today, and I think important to remember, is this is messy stuff. I love Parker Palmer. This quote, he says, it's a hard truth be told. Before spring becomes beautiful, it is plug ugly. <laughs> Nothing but mud and muck. I have walked in the early spring through fields that will suck your boots off. A world so wet and woeful, it makes you yearn for the return of ice. But in that muddy mess, the conditions for rebirth are being created. It's not about being tidy. It's not, it, it, it's not about avoiding the mess. It's about trusting that it will work itself out and that healing will be obtained if we engage. Thank you.